What was the big takeaway today? Yes, yeah, Susan, residents of the city will see a major change in the way police respond. They will no longer respond to calls that aren't considered in progress emergency. That means calls like criminal mischief, theft, harassment, and most burglary alarms will all be handled by an enhanced telephone reporting unit. That means residents will file a police report over the phone. Officers will not respond unless it's an emergency. Also, between the hours of 3 a.m. and 7 a.m., there will be no officers at any of the six stations throughout the city. Call boxes that link directly to 911 have been installed for people to use in case of an emergency. And during the overnight shift, there will be as few as 20 officers to cover the entire city. And we're back. And today I'm joined by our resident bomber, Mike Sterling, and our resident 007 agent, Jeff MD. Thanks for jumping in, guys. So today's topic, we're discussing the dramatic decrease in policing across the country. And there's all kinds of reasons why that's happening. And we'll probably touch on some of that stuff. But the reality of the situation is, is that we're we're kind of going into a purge type situation. The movie, The Purge, where there's no law and order during certain windows of time. And for anybody who's seen the purge movies there's several of them uh this is uh an image from one of them but i'm gonna go to you first jeff just based on the fact that we opened with the pittsburgh video multiple other cities are affected we're gonna get to that but you used to live in pittsburgh so give me your comments on police policing in pittsburgh i i don't see this ending well um the the pittsburgh police bureau not police department they have a bureau um, when I lived there, I lived in the city itself. I lived in the city proper. I could practically walk to downtown from where I was. Within, I don't know, two weeks of us moving there, our mail carrier was murdered two blocks away. Wow. Uh, we just shot him in the head. Um, then we've had, I've chased hookers and johns out of the alley behind my house. Uh, we would find hypodermic needles where people would go up into Garfield, Lincoln, Limington, buy drugs, come down into my neighborhood where it's quiet and safer, and then they'd shoot up in the alleys. And we even had a police high-speed chase end up in our front yard, and we woke up in the middle of the night to having policemen you know, cruising through our backyard with the flashlights looking for the suspects. Um, so those, all those things occurred. At the time, they're talking about not needing cops, you know, that three in the morning till whatever. Um, that's when all that stuff happened. So, safe assumption, safe assumption that you were in a decent neighborhood like this wasn't in. Oh, yeah. No, no. We were in a nice neighborhood. Um, that's what I figured. In Pittsburgh, you can go three blocks and you're in a not so nice neighborhood. Uh, once you cross Penn Avenue, it, it all changed. It changed into a combat zone. But it's not going to end well. There's multiple reasons that we've seen this reduction. A, a big part of it is the 2020, you know, riots and all the movement to defund the police. And I said at the time, people should be careful what they wish for because they may just get it. And so then we saw a number of these, you know, defund politicians turn around and beg people to come back, you know, who had left the law enforcement agencies and it wasn't really hard to predict this was going to happen. And if you want to put your tinfoil hat on, like Keith always says, this whole thing was orchestrated, you know, this reduction in policing, hiring illegal invaders to be cops, to basically get a national police force that would be under control uh, of the feds. But Mike, give me your thoughts on this. I mean, nothing good can come out of this, can it? We've got, you know, high level pol police officials saying that this is a good thing. This is what the data supports. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, but, Nate, you know, we, we all know that nature abhors a vacuum. And again, just like you said, they they this is this is what you get. You know, you we've we've been saying this for for how long you do this. It's not going to turn out good. And again, nature abhors a vacuum. So this is how local militias wind up starting. Right. Uh, you know, a neighborhood watch goes, you know, from, you know, hey, just a neighborhood watch all the way over to, yeah, a bunch of guys patrolling in or a bunch of guys and gals patrolling in, in armor and and friggin ARs. Yeah. And let's face it. 
uh, vast majority of those people are not well trained. You're going to have, you're going to have NDs. You're going to have, you're going to have sectarian killings. You're going to have all kinds of stuff, man. It's going to get spicy. This episode of SDN is brought to you by Switch It Up, your national grid down service provider. Get a quote on a solar PV system with battery backup at switchitupinc.com or click the link in the video description below. So I yeah. think a really good uh, comparison or example there is what happened just down the road in Sanford with George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. So Trayvon Martin was, was a thug. He was not a, a good kid, you know, as Obama and everybody else tried to portray him as. But George Zimmerman what should have never gone out and tried to here we go with the dang apple stuff again george zimmerman really overstepped his bounds not trained and caused a confrontation which ended up in him getting his head being bounced off the curb and then him shooting trayvon martin so they're equal blame to go around the board but it's kind of what you're describing mike you know he took it upon himself to police that neighborhood and it didn't end well for anybody right All right yeah i lived in oviedo when that happened just you know, down the road i was in sanford county uh but that was an example of two stupid people running into each other at the wrong time and when it's that called, happened, called stupid them, criticality yeah um yeah to have two critical masses of stupidity met in the middle and when that happens invariably one if not, or possibly both are going to end up dead. drt and, exactly what happened but Zimmerman had a gun when he should have had a walkie-talkie and I well I think for, to Mike's point it's an example of vigilante justice gone wrong and, yeah. and people who have no training they have the balls bigger than the brain syndrome think that they can manage this stuff and without the training clearly that's not the case and so you raise a really good point there Mike that we should all be concerned over and that as we have reductions in, in well we already have these reductions right i think the last numbers we got from keith is that the average agency is 25 to 50 percent understaffed and so we we opened with this as far as pittsburgh was concerned and again all of these links there'll be one link below to our website and then i'll put all of these links on that page on our website and we have to do that because youtube censors any news websites that they don't like or agree with and if you actually take the time to go through the links we provide they cover the entire political spectrum uh, i want to personally see what each side has to say and then decide for myself what sounds like the truth and what doesn't so i'm going to zip through this fairly quickly you all know the routine which just shows the headlines basically and if you want to read the articles by all means go do so afterwards so here's another uh, headline and basically it's not just won't respond to certain types of calls, won't respond to certain emergency calls. And their telephone unit, by the way, means if you go to one of the precincts and the doors are locked, there's a telephone you can pick up and connect you to 911. If you can't get there, um, you know, best thing you can do is call 911. But again, here's another, you know, article. They're just not going to respond. And it doesn't matter what the nature of that in emergency is, pardon me. So here's another instance, uh, Henrico police will not respond. Uh, this article on Fox, I'm not the biggest fan of Fox, but this article does a pretty good job of telling uh, the story from the police side of things as far as the damage that was done by defund the police, the precarious you know, situation we find ourselves in with police in these days. Here's another one, LAPD is not responding to different types of 911 calls. Uh, here's far left-wing NPR on data showing 15 cities that their response time has dropped dramatically. At the end of the day, it's staffing issues, right? Who wants to be in a job that's being villainized across social media and mainstream media? Here's another one, Associated Press, very left-wing. And so, some cities are responding to this reduced workforce because they just can't, nobody wants a job. They can't hire anybody with mental health crisis, you know, civilian teams instead of police, which 
I've read a number of situations where that has not ended well for the people who responded and they were assaulted and or killed. Here's another article, Stockton, California, not responded. Here's another one, San Francisco, not responding. Here's another one, Austin, not responding. So we're going from blue states to red states here. And then these images here, I'm going to come back to in a minute. I want Jeff to speak to this first. Jeff, well, actually, both of you have traveled the entire globe. You've, you've been in first world, second world countries and seen what happens. So, Jeff, let's start with you because you brought this topic up. What happens in, in those societies, those countries that you've been to when the rule of law no longer exists? You have marauders and gangs in charge. It, it does become sort of like the purge, except you know, the purge was Hollywood. Um, you get so callous to human death that it, it really doesn't mean much to you anymore. Um, I've got photographs from Afghanistan where, you know, someone opens the trunk of a cab and there's two dead bodies in the back because, Hey, that's how you got to move them around. I mean, I personally, I had a friend over there, an Afghan local Afghan who was murdered and, you know, you don't call 911. There's no ambulance. We had to carry his body, his dead body back to his family. You know, I had to drive his blood soaked brain on the head, on the headrest car you know, back to our base so it wouldn't get stripped down to the frame overnight. Wow. Um, it is oh, yeah. just a different planet. And people in this country, you know, those who've been in the military, most of them understand it, certainly. But the average American has no clue what it's like to live in a city where there, there just are no police. Yeah. I mean, I was and, in. And if there are the police, country. if there well, are police, they're all for sale. Well, yeah, absolutely. That that so sounds like Me I was just going to say that sounds a lot like Mexico to me. Because yeah, if you import really the is. third world, you get the third world. Yeah, and become the third world. Let's face yes. it, Mexico has been teetering on the on the on the line between third world and second world pretty much oh, I don't know, since Santa Ana died. So. <laughs> since the Alamo. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, and it's, and, and Jeff is right. I mean, it's, it's, you know, Asia, go to Asia, go to Africa, go to some parts of, of South America. Life's cheap. Yeah. Life's cheap kids. Yeah, All right. Mike, Jeff, repeat the part where he said, Jeff is right. So my yeah. wife can hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff is absolutely right. And is one okay. of the smartest people on the planet. Well, and something about the Pittsburgh situation that, stuck with me is they said, you know, not what they consider non-emergencies. And one of those was burglaries. Well, if someone's breaking into your home and you call the police and they go, eh, it's a burglary, we're not going to respond. And I've got a wife and kids. I have news for you. There's going to be a lot of dead burglars because well, people Calabria aren't going to just it is. Hey, steal, steal all my stuff. You know, threaten my family. No, they're going to blow them out down the stairs with a shotgun. There's be a lot more of those vigilante killings. And the Zimmerman thing, had that been reversed and Zimmerman was the one who died instead of Trayvon Martin, do you think anyone in a neighborhood watch is going to go out unarmed? Quick point. I didn't have it pulled up, but I just pulled it up now. This whole, you know, uh, reduction in policing. Did you guys catch the news out of Canada a couple of days ago with regards to what your protocol should be as far as thieves stealing your car is concerned? No. With the fobs near the door. Leave your keys at your front door. So if somebody wants to steal your car, that they can just reach in the front door, grab the keys, take off with your car, and you're not injured in the process. And I guess in the whole process, you also need to look at the thief and say, sorry, eh? <laughs> <laughs> right. What? <laughs> I'm sure it was my white privilege that made you do this. You know what? That's so. That's the direction we're headed, kids. That's the direction we're headed. Unless we get in the in front of that. That's what I said. Wow, when I read that, and so here's an interesting thing, and and uh, I'll pull it up in a second when you guys are speaking on another subject. But they're fixing to pass a law in Canada that is even worse than some of the laws passed in Europe. So I'm not sure if you've caught this, but there's many European countries, if you speak out against this, you know, massive invasion of third world people, 
it's a criminal offense and they'll lock you up. Well, Canada is now going one step further. Their law states that if they think you might say something like that, that they can give you a life sentence, which is 25 years in Canada and lock you up because they think you might speak out against these invasions that are happening of third world countries coming to their country. I mean, you can't make this shit up. Here we go. <laughs> we will ask the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, funny is this reminds me of a conversation I had with an Australian guy once. And he said, I don't understand your Americans and your, uh, your thing about guns. And I sat him down. I said, look, our two countries are very similar. We were British colonies at one point, you know, far away, et cetera, et cetera. I said, but the main difference is your, your independence was given to you. We took ours by force. And With I guns. think that's what you see in Canada. Again, Canada, you know, England decided just to give them their independence. Yeah, they you just know? outlasted the British. That was all. They kowtowed long enough that, you know, the British were just like, yeah, we're, we're tired of being here. Right. I haven't read this particular article, but I've read a bunch of articles. But life imprisonment, not just for speech crimes, but for the potential that they suspect somebody will speak out against the official narrative. So this would apply to things, people speaking out against immigration from third world countries. This would be anybody speaking out against mandates uh, like the, you know, the sticky thing that goes in your shoulder. If I say the word, the, we'll probably get our video nuked. I, this is actually the most draconian of all of them that I've seen. And we're kind of getting off the path of the, the policing issue. But it is related to policing because if somebody reports you for speaking out against the official narrative in these other countries, you're going to jail. So there was an instance not too long ago, somewhere in the UK, a person who had no criminal record, uh, lots of people vouch for this guy. He put up some stickers in his little town uh, saying something, speaking out against this mass, you know, migration invasion that's been happening. He I, And I believe he was a school teacher, by the way. He was just sentenced to two years in jail and he has been jailed because he spoke out against the mass migration. So wrong think. And then the next piece I think that goes with that would be what's the Supreme Court justice that Biden appointed point, excuse me. Appointed. Yeah. Um, did you guys catch her comments yesterday on the first amendment? Yeah. Scary. Yeah. That's yeah. The, the first amendment's going to get in, in the way of, uh, of, of us being able to, uh, Tell you uh, the truth. Yeah, it hamstrings the government. Yeah. Yeah. Hamstrings is, is the that, word. Yeah. So yeah. this is all in reaction, by the way, to the Biden admin wanting to have control over all the social media platforms. And they had this kind of control before Elon stepped in and bought Twitter. And that was uncovered. And then it was uncovered that that Meta, excuse me, and the other uh, big tech companies were doing the same thing. And Meta's actually said that they're going to continue to ramp that up. So government officials have had the ability to log into a portal on the back end of these social media sites, delete comments, flag comments, do research on individuals speaking out against the, the narrative, the official narrative. And then you have a Supreme Court justice saying that the First Amendment is hamstringing the government's ability to censor information. I mean, again, we're kind of getting off topic as far as the reduction in, in police uh, resources is concerned, but this is policing. This is policing wrong thing, straight out of 1984. I mean, it, it's it's crazy. Yeah, uh, 1984. The book was just so everybody knows um, that that was meant to be a warning, not a manual. Yeah. Okay. We we don't do those things. That's that's all bad. Double plus good citizens and comrades. Yes. Anyway, but it was basically saying that those cases will limit the government's ability to speak out. And I'm like, the government doesn't have a right to speak out, but they do all the time anyway. You know, we have how many press releases a day are released by the White House? They don't have a problem talking. What they have a problem with is with us talking. Because if we say things that they disagree with, 
we need to be censored. But they say things that are just out and out lies all the time, but no one censors them. So I'm, the name of the act is escaping me right now, but there, I believe it was at some point in the 1960s, there was an act that uh, became law that stated that when the government, our, our government was communicating to the rest of the world, they were free to spread whatever propaganda they wanted to, but they were not allowed to spread that propaganda domestically. And Obama overturned that during his administration and basically took gloves off all of these government uh, agencies and politicians to spread BS as much as they want. And it, it's happened. It's happening. It's brutal. And people believe this crap because... They grew up believing in the government, believing in mainstream media. You know, after the, the church hearings in the 70s, when you know it came out that we were trying to kill Fidel Castro and all this stuff and spying on students, there under Ford, there was Executive Order 12333, which codified and limited what the United States intel community could do domestically. And okay. part of that was you cannot propagandize in the United States. You can't spy for the CIA could not spy on U.S. citizens, couldn't collect information on U.S. citizens, couldn't deal with U.S. citizens unless they knew you were CIA. I mean, I had to go and say, hi, yeah, I'm with the CIA. I'd like to talk to you. And if they volunteered, fine. If they told me to pound sand, I, you know, I left. So much of that has gone out the window. And that can only be done by either someone just blatantly flouting the executive order or somebody changed the executive order. And the only one who can change an executive order is the, the executive. But right. there's something else people need to know about executive orders. A U.S. citizen does not have to obey an executive order. It is not law. It only applies to government employees in the executive branch. Congress doesn't even have to pay attention to them. So anyone says there's an executive order, tell them to go pound sand. Let's reel this back in again. And I've got another one I want to pull up on the screen. Good points, Jeff, 100%. But back to the topic at hand of the police not policing because of, you know, all the reasons we've been discussing. Not everybody's aware of this. The Supreme Court ruled that, you know, whatever, 15, 16 years ago, something like that, that the police do not have an obligation to protect you as a citizen. So when the purge happens because of these cutbacks where police across the country are not responding during certain hours of the day or not responding to certain types of crimes like burglaries which then have the opportunity to turn into a rape or a murder or an abduction they're you they're not responsible according to the supreme court so that's a pretty big deal so kind of on that topic i want to go back to uh, the pictures that you brought to our attention jeff when you have no law enforcement, you have no rule of law, and you end up with a situation like what's going on in Haiti, which we've covered pretty in depth. And I'm just going to zip through these quickly. Again, the link to our website will be below with an article that has all of these links. But you're looking at, at dead bodies all over the place, reports of cannibalism. I can say I've seen two out of the three videos that got posted next before they got taken down. And it was, uh, was not a very pleasant thing, but this is what happens when you have no police, uh, the gangs in Haiti basically burned all the police stations to the ground and, you know, are, are ruling as marauders, whatever you want to call them. How close are we to something like this happening in America? What, three missed meals. And a power outage. <laughs> it almost so sounds nine like missed meals. Nine missed okay. meals. Three days. And a power oh. outage. And a power <laughs> outage. Yeah. yeah. Is that kind of like? You. Is that kind of like an end of partridge in a pear tree? Like I mean, it just kind of sound like it was going that direction there. Just saying. Uh, I mean, it could be a cartridge in a bear tree, for that matter. <laughs> you know, just look. Just don't step on my shrubbery. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Inside story or inside joke for anybody who didn't see Monday's SDN live, the shrubbery. Or look so, behind me. Don't mess with my shrubbery. <laughs> yeah. So the reason I asked that question is because I would argue in some cities, we're actually already seeing a similar state. Uh, yeah. 
you know, Baltimore, Detroit, cities like that that are just absolutely really destitute. Uh, I've read articles, not just recently, but over the years of, you know, dead bodies being found and recovered days later. Uh, no effort expended on trying to discover who committed the crime, just swept under the rug and carry on. So again, people should be careful what they wish for. They may just get it. So I'm sure we're going to have comments down below from the typical snipers who say all cops are, you know, bad people, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know what? That's just flat out not the truth. That's just low information, low IQ people, lemmings who've had their brains turned to mush by groups like BLM and Antifa and whatnot. But the fact of the matter is that we have this confluence of events happening right now and we've got out of control inflation. We've got out of control immigration of unvetted people coming across the border that we've covered ad nauseum. We have crime rates on the rise. We have policing literally falling off a cliff as far as the number of active duty officers and what the police will even respond to. We're getting dangerously close to a societal collapse, in my opinion. And I'm not that guy. I'm not the chicken little. I typically rail against people who are the chicken littles. But boy, howdy, you got to be blind not to see the writing on the wall from all of this. What happens when we have a major attack? We're kind of going, I'm going to go a little tangent here. I don't know if you caught this, but we captured a Hezbollah terrorist a couple of days ago at the border. And we know that there's thousands of them here. So what happens if the, the Chinese, Iranians, North Koreans, Russians attack our infrastructure, nuke the internet, nuke communications networks, Hezbollah, you know, initiates a number of terrorist attacks. There's no food on the shelf. I mean, it's literally that close to a complete and utter collapse. We've got somewhere around 600,000 law enforcement officers in the country, city PD to feds, somewhere around... Uh, 1.6 million active duty and reservists in the military. Just a few short years ago, that combined number was about 3.2 million. And now it's somewhere in the 2.3, 2.4 million range. That's not very many for 330 to 350 million people, right? Fragile is the point I'm trying to make, really fragile. My personal goal always with Survival Dispatch News is that we take some news that's probably been suppressed try to get it out to a larger audience to raise awareness and then try to give our audience actionable advice. And some of this stuff sounds like a broken record, but that's okay because repetition matters. So I'll go to you first, Mike, in light of all this stuff happening and in light of the fact that you are your own first responder anymore, what can people do? What are the options for people? Well, and I think we saw this yesterday on our stream when we were talking to a few people. First, you have to wrap your head around the fact that you are on your own. Nobody's coming to save you. All right. Now, take a, st take a step. Take the next step. Fix problems. Okay. Um, so the first thing, as always, that I'm always screaming is organize. If you and your neighbors are not organized with each other, just like happened in the Balkans, just like is happening in South Africa right now, if you are not organized because you cannot stay awake 24-7, if you're not organized, you're going to come apart like a cheap Vietnamese suit, period. Um, but if you can get your, if you can get your, your neighbors and your, 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 your people, whoever, organized, right, and then get some training in behind that, um, the, the organization of the training matter more than the equipping. Um, but God, you know, if, if, if you don't have a weapon, good Lord, you know, he who is with, he who is without a sword, sell his cloak and buy one. Right. And for crying out loud, you can go to Palmetto state armory right now. You can buy an AR and a pistol that are passable for $800. Yep. Period. Right. Get that stuff get trained, get some training in you. But remember that if you are going to be your own first responder, the first responsibility that you have is to think. Don't just automatically think that you're going to go to war with somebody because you may wind up shooting your neighbor who's walking his dog. All good advice. Jeff, what are the highlights for you that you could give our audience actionable things they can do? Well, I, I think if I was in a city, 
I would be much more worried than if I was in a small town. Um, I don't think you're going to see small town police departments just fold. And even if they do, people in small towns tend to know each other. They tend to stick together. They know who's who. But in a major city, if you're in a Los Angeles, if you're in San Francisco or Oakland, and it starts to disintegrate, the cops, you know, as, as Keith has told us before, they got their own families to worry about. And it, it's going to get real ugly real fast just because you have a critical mass of bad guys. And, you know, in, in a small town, you might have a handful and everybody knows who they are. And if he shows up at your front door, eh. Uh, but in, if you're in Oakland, there's no shortage. If you're in Philadelphia, there's, there's lots of those bad guys to go around just because the population is so big. And I hate to say it, a lot of those people gravitate to those kind of cities because there's just more victims. Right. And Pred predators Tony's are going to hunt in the watering hole. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good analogy. Tony Blower has repeatedly said that, you know, we have a lot of complacency in our society because people have outsourced their safety, meaning that they, they've outsourced it to the authorities. And, you know, don't here we go with this stupid stuff from Apple again, golly, um, you know, haven't taken responsibility for that. So I, I just think a lot of people haven't crossed that threshold yet because they've been spoon fed this crap from the mainstream media and haven't come to the realization that they are their own first responder and there is nobody coming to save you or rescue you. So actually the very first thing I had on my list, Jeff, because it's a hard thing is if people have the ability to move to a rural location or the country, that's, that's my number one recommendation. And then my number two recommendation, which is, you know, largely based on Mike's advice is to get training. I was on Brave TV earlier today. Dr. Jason Dean asked me the same questions. And, you know, I, I gave him the same story. We always do at Survival Dispatch. Instead of filling a safe full of guns and ammo and going to the range where all you can really do is sight your optic in and get familiarity with your controls. It doesn't really do beyond that. What, buy some force multipliers, night vision, maybe some 3A panels that you can be mobile in and get training, 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 training. You know, we're going to waft uh, where our family trains or world of firearms training this weekend. It's expensive. It's the best of the best for training. We didn't have to pay for it. We did a, a trade with them. But again, Mike did training with barrel and hatchet under $300 for a, a, a really thorough course for an entire day. And they travel across the country. So that's something Mike can endorse firsthand is barrel and hatchet. But Jason asked me, he had, there was a comment from one of the people watching his video ask, you know, for recommendations on getting training wherever they lived. And, you know, my advice is go to the gun ranges, go to the gun stores and ask them who they recommend or who they use. It's not, not a guarantee it's going to be the best of the best, but that's a really good spot to start. But it's a start. You've got yeah. to put one foot in front of the other. You can't go holding out for 10 years waiting for a slot to go to gun site. Right. You know, don't do not do that. Be smart. A little bit of training now is way better than an amazing bit of training 10 years from now. Yeah, I, there has to be some sense of urgency today, right? <clears throat> so after training, I, you know, again, sound like a broken record, but People re really need to top up all of their preps before. Like, here we go with this dang thing again. Golly. Um, it's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. It's, it, you're just having fun watching me get pissed off that it keeps turning itself back on again. <laughs> top up your preps. So food, water, ammunition, medical gear. Get training on your medical gear in addition to just utilizing your weapons. I've mentioned it on the last live session. I'll mention it again. Go to our website under the connect menu up top. Grab the home defense plan. Everybody has different circumstances, right? Like I think one of the biggest, uh, one of my largest pet peeves with the survival prepping community and probably society at large is that people feel that whatever is best for them is best for everybody. And that's just not the case. Two plus two equals four. That's an absolute. But these people who rag on others in our comment section, this is the way you need to do it. Myself, as soon as I hear that from somebody, I just turn off completely because uh, they're not realizing that we all have different circumstances. So 
what's good for me may not be good for Jeff, may not be good for Mike. What's good for Mike may be good for Jeff, but not for me. You can't say what's 100% right for somebody else. And it's pure hubris to think so. So at the end of the day, I, I would say gather information from multiple sources, our channel, other channels, and put the pieces together yourself instead of just relying on a checklist of things from one supposed expert whose anecdotal references are not absolute. Do we have anything else we want to add on the topic of uh, police agencies being understaffed and not responding to certain types of crimes anymore? I do. There are actually uh, several red states and red cities that are offering wonderful sign-up bonuses for officers to come from these cities that they are just being absolutely crushed by by stupid people hey come on out to uh come on out to nashville come on out to jacksonville come out to all these great cities out here like a ten thousand dollar signing bonus stuff like that my brother-in-law is working on one of those right now to, to leave seattle you know what there are some places in the country that this is happening there are some places in this country that they're not happening and if you can't see where those places are happening, you need to wake up. So let, let's actually end on this, Mike, and feel free to weigh in as well, Jeff. But, Mike, you've got an upcoming trip to a large city that has had some, some really bad uh, stuff in the news for years now. And if you want to name the city, that's fine. I'm going to Manhattan. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, just did, I just didn't want to reveal the city in case you you had a stalker you know, who might, might try and follow you there and, because you'll be essentially unarmed. I am not looking forward to this. You know, those, those are these are the things that you wind up having to do for family. You don't want to do them, but you do them. And yeah, I mean, I, I have been I've been hitting the books real hard. I've been I, I had to get a little bit of equipment because, yeah. I, I can't be armed with the normal things that I, that I'm armed with. I definitely can't take my shrubbery with me and I can't take a herring either. So, um, yeah, we're, we're just down to a situation where sometimes you gotta go to these places. I don't like it. I will do a, I will do a, a video from there for some of the EDC that, uh, that I'm taking, but I am extremely uncomfortable with it because I don't want to go, but you know, Again, the things that you do for family, so I understand it. Practice your harsh language. I'm, I'm uh, you know, about 20 years as a sergeant, my, my, my harsh language is, is fairly well refined. I just use it sparingly. So actually, though, at the end of the day, like today's topic, decreased staffing levels that we have across the country for police forces, combined with the fact of them not responding to certain crimes, it's a good dovetail into you going to New York City and being in an environment where if you defend yourself, even without a gun, you're probably facing charges and potentially jail time as well. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I, I reached out to several people on the self-defense legal side and talked to them about exactly what I got to do. I mean, like I can, I can take a knife, but it basically has to be a short knife and you know I, that's that's going to take away the normal normal knife that i use and and i mean the reality of the situation is if you use a knife in a self-defense situation you're going to get crucified that's all there is yeah. to it so i can't even carry a burna out there which really know, would, yeah no there's no way because it's an air gun and air guns are are verboten and all that kind of stuff so Yo, oh, yeah, I, I, I can carry pepper spray and I can carry a stun gun. And that's about as that's about as tough as it's going to get. It's insanity. But the reason I said it dovetails with our topic today is that, OK, so if the cops aren't going to respond, all these reasons we've already mentioned right. and you're in a blue jurisdiction and shooting somebody is probably going to put yourself in jail, even if you're protecting your life that you need to look at some alternative means, alternative things to protect yourself because we're back to, we've outsourced our safety for generations now and that's just not the case anymore. Well, and that's why I, that's why I go back to the, to the, the ultimate tool that you need to be using is the gray squishy thing between your ears. Right. 
the first thing that you need to realize is is that you've got to think your way through these things. And, you know, I'm going to do my absolute level best to rely on avoidance whenever possible. And I'm going to walk my way out of those situations whenever possible. But I'm also, you know, going to be prepared for, you know, hey, I, I know I've got your wallet, but I want more. Yeah, right. I, I ain't going to give you that. So, yeah. Well, actually, that brings up a good point relative to New York City. <clears throat> I had a friend of mine here in Florida who used to do haul stuff into downtown New York City. And he'd do a couple trips a week. And he carried two wallets. One he hid and the other one he had a bunch of BS stuff. And I think you've done this before, Mike. And he, there were situations where they would jump up on both sides of his rig. They'd point guns at him, give us your wallet. He'd hand them the, the fake wallet and escape sort of thing. Not a bad strategy, even for just walking on the streets of New York. Yeah, I've carried a throwdown wallet for years. And yeah, it's got all kinds of stuff in it. And if you look at it real quickly, oh well, yeah, you know, it matches and it's got it's got twenty five, thirty dollars in cash in it and, and a whole bunch of long expired you know, cards or fake cards, stuff like that. So that's probably a good point to wrap up on. We appreciate everybody following Survival Dispatch. Stay alert and stay safe, especially if you go to New York City where Mike is going to be soon. <laughs> All right. Peace this out. This video is sponsored by William Tell Archery Supplies, home of the Mini Striker Crossbow. Click the link in the description below to learn more.